Hello. Hello. Hi. So Hi. we're going to do our traditional banter, especially since our captioning is having some tiny technical issues. So uh, Sarah, you do have premium cat content, do you? Uh, I have at least one premium cat content here on the side of the desk. I, I could slide. Oh, never mind. It's coming here. Come here. Yep, never mind. It stopped. Uh, I was going to point out that this is Bang Bang Con 21. And did you know we've had 21 talks so far? Nice. Nice. It's, it's not like we're ending now, though, right? Like we have more talks. No, but... no, no, no. Yeah, we're only like halfway through. Slightly That's a good number. Come, come. I'm I'm hearing some rumors that our captioning situation will be solved soon. But, oh, hi, Kitty. So this is Theodosius. I apologize to the captioner that has to spell that. Uh, one of my two very large cat beasts. He is so fancy with the whole. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is the one that's made of pure love. He he just wants love and cuddles all the time. Yeah. Which is great. I mean, I, I love very social friendly cats, but also this guy's nearly 20 pounds and weighs a lot. So sometimes his um, desire for cuddles is very heavy. <laughs> it's a lot of love. I think we should do a cat cat con, you know? We should just have a bang bang con stream that's all cats all day. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Premium cat content just for yeah. you from bang bang con. Um, I believe I've just read that we have captioning now. Not that we have to stop the banter, but... We should continue the banter to give everyone time to, to come here. And, uh, you know, this is also our only uh, morning stream session at North American time uh, for, for all of our attendees. So, you know, maybe everyone is just checking their calendars and being very stressed about being late. I know I was. I was like, oh, no, I have a meeting at work, and I'm going to make it, and I'm going to make it. So, uh, yeah, I was stressed about being late for the session the whole morning. <laughs> yeah, and I was definitely kind of thinking I'm used to the sync watches happening now, so I'm just kind of like, oh, that, that's mostly taken care of. I don't have to worry too much. But I'm like, oh, no, I do have to worry. I, <laughs> I, I, have, I have to, to be here camera. and present uh, for, <laughs> for the video. <laughs> yeah, you're way more pro than me. I'm always just like, oh, I, I need my T-shirt. <laughs> I got it. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm bang bang conning today. It's yeah. I feel like I I need more bang bang con t-shirts though. Because... I I kind of wish I had a whole rainbow of them. It's just so I could like, what am I feeling today? Maybe I'm feeling orange. I don't. I, know. I think we can make that happen. A rainbow of bang bang con t-shirts. Probably. Yeah, something we can think about for next year. So you can buy one of each color, and then you know every because if we do it for over a week next time you need a new t-shirt every day yeah. uh, otherwise you're just doing laundry every day right? yeah yeah although it it is a little much to be on camera for a whole week straight but i don't know it, it's doable it's doable yeah you you're, you're doing that you're rocking that we're, we're making it happen <laughs> yeah definitely uh what's been your favorite part of bing bang con so far I love the fact that um, because, you know, as an organizer, we don't get to see the talks as much as if we were watching. So especially if I'm emceeing, I'm like, oh, no, like I'm missing half of this talk because I'm like trying to organize stuff in the background. So I love the fact that we have the sync watches and that we have recordings pretty much right away so that I can catch up and then I can go to the Discord channel and scroll back to you know the right time and then i see the reactions i can just scroll through them kind of real time so i have that yeah. experience even if i wasn't able to focus on that so i love it what, what's your favorite part yeah um i have an absolute disaster so i have three monitors um <laughs> these are the two bottom ones and then I have the top one here uh so i have uh <laughs> the live video over here i have like the website over here to make sure like all the captioning is happening accurately and then I have like the stuff we want to make sure we cover, like bios and everything. And then I have like Discord up here. And it's it's a lot, but <laughs> it's it's kind of interesting to be able to kind of see the the chats as they're happening, um, along with like knowing the website's all still working and still knowing what I have to talk about. So you're you're really there. All the ways yeah. you could be there, you're there. Apart from maybe skittish, because it would be a bit too much to be in oh, skittish. Yeah, skittish is a bit much for this. <laughs> Uh, it pulls up very nicely, uh, you know, in one of my three monitors. So it 
Frank's great. Yeah, I think I think that's enough banter. I think everyone who oh, needed a couple of minutes to find a link and, and get to the right place is here. So again, welcome everyone to session six of Bang Bang Con 2021. Um, we would like to start with thanking our sponsors. Sarah, do you want to thank our sponsors? Uh, sure. Let's see. So we have several sponsors. They help cover the cost of the conference. Even though it's virtual, there's still a lot of costs that happen behind the scenes. We pay captioners, we pay AV people, we pay all of our speakers. We think these things are really important. And so we want to make sure we absolutely can cover them as well as keep costs reasonable to you all. So we have excellent sponsors, uh, Xander and uh, Dealey, I believe. Um, I don't know, I, I've not really looked up all the sponsors. Uh, they're great, they're wonderful. Uh, especially thank them. If you see them mentioning things on Twitter, be sure to shout them out. And then we have a variety of other awesome sponsors as well that have covered various uh, things, including Wherewithal, who's doing our captioning. So uh, thank all of them. Please. Um, yeah, I can I can try and read their names really fast. It's gonna be super fun for reading them in my second language. So our awesome sponsors are Wherewithal, Discourse, Full Story, Two Sigma, Phase Zero, Mapbox, and Accelerated Tech. I did it. You did. So it. I, by the end of the conference, I'll just remember all of the names, and I won't have to read them anymore. Because yeah, yeah it's definitely. awesome that. We get to thank them every time. Um, I, I really appreciate having sponsors. And some of them have been with us for a few years now, and they keep coming back. So, you know, this whole fun thing we're doing, volunteering to make a conference to have some fun, um, apparently also very interesting for, for people to to come and, and promote their companies. I'm, I'm happy about that. <laughs> yeah. And I really love seeing both recurring people that keep showing up every year, as well as the new people that have said, hi, this is my first Bang Bang Con. I heard it was so great from so-and-so. And I'm like, it's it's wonderful to just see that. Yeah, and the people who say, hi, this is my second Bang Bang Con. My first Bang Bang Con was also virtual and I loved it. And I'm like, that is so perfect that you came back yeah. a year and a bit into the pandemic. You decided this is again an event you want to take part in. Uh, that is, um, yeah, that is exciting for us that people still want to come here uh, while well, we are slowly getting to the state where we can maybe meet in person. So Yeah, because last uh, year it was very, I mean, the pandemic just happened. I, I think everything was really scrambled. Kind of, I, yeah. I know some of the other conferences I helped organize very scrambled together at the last minute. Just like, what it was, do we even do now? And <laughs> It was a scramble. Yes, you're, you're right. But we made it work and it was yeah, wonderful. It was and this year it's it's also wonderful. So. We're super happy. So uh, before we get to our talks, just one more reminder that uh, we'd love to see your reactions and we'd love for you to tweet things at us, especially, you know, any excitement from the talks, any fun photos, any, you know, fun things you talked about on Discord. Uh, we really love to be mentioned and hashtagged. Just, you know, I like to feel popular when I log into our account as opposed to my personal account. It's, it's fun to get so many mentions. Uh, so if you're tweeting at us, uh, remember that uh, with all our love for BTS, our bang bang con hashtag is unfortunately no longer <laughs> us. So add the virtual in front of it, hashtag virtual bang bang con, so we know you mean us and not the wonderful K-pop band that we all love. Or just mention at bang bang con, which is actually us. Uh, we managed to, <laughs> to keep our actual name on Twitter. So. Uh, make sure you tweet all the things and you give love to our speakers on Twitter and retweet things and just, you know, be happy around um, having this experience. Um, and yeah, do you want to introduce our first speaker? Um, I can sure try. Let's see. So our first speaker, uh, the title is called Ice Hurt. All you need is cardboard and motors. So uh, let's see. Dasha Elena is a Russian digital artist based in Paris, France. Her work explores the relationship we develop with the digital devices we use on a daily basis, specifically in regards to the human body. Elena's work centers around the notions of care and technology, DIY practices, and low-tech solutions to examine various issues such as phone addiction, tech-related health problems, and privacy in the digital age. She is the, center, she is the founder of the Center for Technological Pain, a center that proposes DIY solutions to health problems caused by digital technologies for which she has received an honorary mention at Ars Electronica. She's also the co-director of No School. 
So please welcome Desha Elena. Hello everyone, my name is Dasha Lina and I'm a digital artist originally from Moscow in Russia and now based in Paris. Um, and today I'll be giving this presentation that's titled Do Your Eyes Hurt? All You Need Is Cardboard and Motors, Okay, and A Lot of Super Glue. And before I start this presentation, I would like to briefly introduce myself. Um, like I said, I'm a digital artist, so I work a lot with different technologies, but I also often don't use any technology at all in my work. And what really interests me is the way that technology actually influences our body, whether mentally or physically. And the project that I will present today is very much about that. So this project is called Center for Technological Pain, and I've been working on it for quite some time now. And um, it's a mock company that I created in which I develop DIY solutions to health problems that come from technology. Um, and the reason why I started working on this project was because I needed a thesis project to graduate and I had no ideas. And I started looking around myself, around my classmates and just other people that I saw every day. And a lot of people were complaining about the different problems that they had because of the way that they were using their devices, like whether the way that they were sitting or standing or looking down at their phone and things like that. And so I decided to start sort of sketching ideas for the different problems that I was noticing around me um, and different solutions. So here you see some of these sketches. Um, those are different things that either I experienced or my friends told me about. And actually the first object that I ever built was this problem number five. Um, the problem being that uh, straining your eyes from staring at screens for too long and the solution being glasses with shades that automatically close for 10 minutes every hour. So here you can see the very first object that I ever built um, are these glasses. And um, at the time I was really bad at physical computing and I still am pretty bad at physical computing but I've gotten a little bit better. Uh, so when I actually made these glasses and when they actually worked, it was very sort of empowering and it, it felt really great to um, realize that I was able to make something that moves by myself without anyone's help. Um, but the way that I did it was also really stupid. Here you can see all of the failures of this project. Um, for some reason I decided to use two Arduinos and I had these like massive motors attached to very frail plastic glasses. So obviously they were very heavy and they kept falling off of my face. Um, but despite all of that, it, once I did accomplish uh, making a video with these glasses fully functioning, um, it felt really, really good. Um, despite the fact that you know, it's very sort of cheap and DIY made. Um, and so once I made this object, I decided to, to share it on social media and I got nine likes on Twitter, which at the time to me was like amazing. Um, and keep in mind that one of those nine likes was the official Arduino account. So um, this sort of lit my fire and it kind of forced me to keep making these objects, which um, now I'm very grateful that I kept doing this. But I also got my first sort of hater, which also at the time felt really good because it meant that somebody actually paid attention enough to this project to have a negative opinion about it. <laughs> so this conversation is in French, but I will quickly translate it. So Panduino said, Sorry, I don't, I don't see what this is. To which I said, it's a pair of glasses that uh, closes, or that the glasses close to let your eyes um, rest while you're using a computer. To which P Panduino said, could just turn off the screen, no? And I said, well, you know, it's made to force people that forget to take a break, take a break, or people that forget to move away or close their screen. Uh, to which they said, I think that if I had glasses like this, all the time, it would just make me more tired than the break would relieve me. And I said, okay, well, you know, it's just a prototype. In the future, the glasses would move slowly and they would close more like 10 minutes every hour, to which they said, well, in any case, it's art, so it's experimental. Um, so 
yeah, this was, you know, this was great to me, it was a success. I kept making these objects. And here's another prototype that is called Pillow for Proper Positioning. So here you see um, it's a fan that is blowing into a plastic bag that um, sort of allows you to, to place your wrists in a more proper way um, when you're using your laptop. And you will notice that it is connected to a battery, so it is portable, it is light, and it works okay. Um, another object that I'll show you is this hands-free headset. Uh, this is actually my favorite object out of all of the ones that I've made. And it also shows just how absurd some of my solutions were. It also shows that this is, at the end of the day, an art project, not a design project. So it's not meant to be uh, super well done and finished and beautiful. It's meant to sort of mock the way that we interact with our devices and just to which degree we are attached to them. So... Um, here you see, yes, this headset in which you can place your phone and you don't have to move your neck anymore. You don't have to use your hands as much. So it relieves you of your neck pain um, when you're using your phone. But uh, at the end of the day, of course, it also prevents you from seeing anything that is in front of you. So um, is it a success? I'd say so. And while I was working on these objects, um, what I noticed was that actually, while it was nice to be able to share these objects with other people and to get their feedback, what I really enjoyed the most was the actual process of making them. And I think that being in a classroom environment really helped with that because other people were, you know, suggesting other problems that I should work on, or they were helping me um, come up with the best way to build these sort of prototypes. So I quickly realized that what I really wanted to do with this project was do workshops. And so this is one of the first workshops that I'd ever done with this project. Um, it was at Le Cube, which is this art center outside of Paris. And this workshop is with um, teenagers between 10 and about 15 years old. So this is actually a 12 year old who built this. Um, the, pro the problem that he wanted to tackle the most was uh, the fact that some people don't know about covering their, their surveillance camera or they take it off to do a Skype and then they forget, which, you know, at the time was a pretty good solution and now is an even better one because we're all constantly on Zoom. And so he completely by himself built this whole thing where you press a button and after a certain time, the camera the shutter closes. And that was amazing to me. Um, another workshop that I did was at Meta Marathon in Dusseldorf. And so here you see two other solutions. One of them is the focus box. So it's this uh, object that forces you to say focus at your screen and there's even uh, sponges uh, by your ears that kind of block out surrounding sound. And on the right you see the back painkiller water hat. So this is a solution against hunching. Um, it's a box that is filled with water that has holes in front of it so that when you start hunching down water will pour onto your laptop and break it. Um, and here's the last solution from a workshop that I'll show you. It's also a solution against hunching and it was done at Hackers and Designers in Amsterdam. And uh, this is a more technological also solution in which uh, once you hunch down, your computer screen turns red. So it's also like supposed to remind you to sit straight and, and uh, sit well, yeah. And um, so the, the thing that really surprised me about making doing these workshops and the reason why I kept doing them is because not only was I able to meet other people, um, I was able to have critical discussions about the way that technology influences us with people from all around the world. And I was also able to force other people to make these ridiculous, ridiculous objects with me. So, um, here is just another picture from the Meta Marathon workshop and I just wanted to give this presentation to maybe encourage other people to uh, to do physical computing or to do whatever it is that you don't feel comfortable with, but also to encourage you to make with other people, to make connections with other people, 
um, which I think at this time is really, really important. Um, and if you want to connect with me, you can do so by following me on Instagram or on Twitter, which you see on the slide. And I hope that you all figure out what your problems with technology are and you find your own cardboard solutions to them. Thank you. That was great. I love that. I, I loved it because one of the things I found, I, I've done a lot of hardware building over like the last decade on robotics teams and elsewhere, um, is that when you make software, you can't hold it. You can't see mm -hmm. it. You, you can kind of like see the visual representation of it on your monitor, but you know, I, I can't hold my software. I can hold my phone, but it's not the actual software and building things with hardware is just really cool because you can hold it, you can see it, you can use it. it it's, it's great. I, I love building hardware things. Yeah. I love that. It's cardboard. I mean, it seems so accessible. I know there's like a lot of work that goes into this design because I see it. I'm like, Oh, I would love to design something like this. And then two seconds later, my brain is like, Oh, this, this is actually pretty hard. It's like, especially that overhead, you know, uh, phone holder. I'm like, that that actually is pretty complex to set up, but I have a lot of cardboard in my house, as does probably anyone in this pandemic, and I do have an exacto knife, so we will see what comes out of that over the long weekend that's coming. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of those, even on the hardware side, were pretty simple things. You don't really need really really expensive electronics either. Just just some simple servo motors and a few different kinds of sensors can really make the whole thing accessible. So I, I loved it that it wasn't like we, we had to go to a production factory and build all sorts of crazy electronics. Like, like it's really accessible and it's great. Yeah, especially that back straightener with a red screen. I I think I need that for reasons. <laughs> I, I, I might need one of those too for a friend, for a friend, yes. Yeah, yeah, friend. Um, so thank you, Dasha. That was that was awesome. And uh, looking at Discord, it also inspired a lot of people to look at their cardboard with, with a lot of ideas. Um, and it was just delightful. Thank you for sharing that. And our next speaker uh, is Sven Dulstrand, and he's gonna talk about changing a single byte saves me seconds every day. Sven is a curious human being who loves acquiring new skills and shares what he has learned with other people. He knows enough to be dangerous around soldering irons, crochet hooks, pen plotters, and paddles. For a living, Sven builds accessible and performant websites. Happy Bang Bang Con! I'm Sven, and I love computers in all shapes and forms, like this Game Boy. I'm also a fan of Tetris. I played that game for a long time now, almost about a quarter century. It's probably just nostalgia, but to me, Tetris for Game Boy is an almost perfect piece of software. Except for one stupid thing. This annoying copyright screen you have to watch before being allowed to play. For eight seconds. Eight seconds is a pretty long time when all you want to do is play some Tetris. That copyright notice has stolen hours of my life that I never will get back. But maybe my girlfriend and I could save some precious time in the future. We have a traditional Tetris summer tournament every year. It's a friendly competition, nothing too serious, just for fun. When, when playing with friends, Everyone's a winner, right? So anyway, I, I saw potential to save time and ask myself, is it possible to hack Tetris and get rid of that copyright screen forever? Well, spoiler alert, it is possible. I just had to spend countless hours learning the basics of reverse engineering first. That's what I did. I'm going to tell you a short reverse engineering story and hopefully in about eight minutes or so, you will know enough to get started hacking on your favorite Game Boy game. So, first of all, I learned as much as I could about the console itself. 
and there's a lot of information out there. I watched the Ultimate Game Boy talk by Michael Steele. He explains everything in that one. Highly recommended. The official programming manual is also floating around on the interwebs. Uh, I guess Nintendo is not too happy about that. And believe it or not, I learned some exciting and useful stuff from the American Game Boy patent. And after feeding my brain with all that information, my next step was to get the game from its physical game pack onto my computer. For that I used Yoe Yobex, a gadget that lets you read Game Boy games and dump them to your computer over USB. It also works the other way around, uh, enabling playing modified games on a real Game Boy. I bought an empty flashcard for that. And thanks to yo yo bags, I managed to get a copy of Tetris onto my computer. Now I could use a hex editor to inspect that file. Every file I've created, images, text files and copies of Tetris, is just a bunch of numbers, bytes. And hex editors makes it possible to view and shuffle those numbers around. It looks like this. Behold the first few bytes of Tetris. All these numbers have meaning. Some represent game assets, like graphics. Most numbers are machine code, the actual program. Here are three things I learned during my research phase. The pattern told me that every Game Boy program starts at memory location 100 hexadecimal. At that location, you will find machine code. In the programming manual, I read about the instructions available to programmers, like my favorite instruction, the, the NOP instruction, or no operation. It does nothing. Lastly, the slides from Michael Steele's talk have this handy lookup table that lists the actual value of each instruction. Remember, everything is a number, the no operation instruction is encoded using the number zero, for example. I know what you are thinking right now. What's the first instruction of Tetris? It must be something clever, right? Well, the memory location 100 contains, wait for it, the number zero. The first instruction of Tetris is no operation. Crazy, but true. Hex editors are great, and we will get back to it later, but I also downloaded Sameboy. A cross-platform Game Boy emulator that comes with a debugger, memory inspector, and other tools. It's an impressive piece of open source software. But before digging into Sameboy, I took a step back and came up with a theory. I knew two things about the copyright notice that it shows for about 8 seconds, and that you could skip ahead after about 4 seconds. Just spam the buttons on the Game Boy. My theory was that the game keeps track of time somewhere in memory. A counter that when it reaches a certain value, the game knows 8 seconds has passed. If I could find this theoretical place in memory, maybe I could alter it to trick Tetris into showing the game menu right away. That was my theory anyway. Maybe it was dumb, but at least it was mine. And with that freshly baked theory in mind, I started Tetris and opened up the memory inspector. I then used my eyeballs to watch out for anything resembling a counter in memory. Because, you know, of my theory. <laughs> I saw nothing like that, instead my eyes fixated on the memory location here. I'm going to play back what I saw, so keep close attention to the highlighted memory. When the game first boots, the value is FB. It changes to 25 when the copyright notice shows up, and again after about 4 seconds. And then twice to 6, rapidly followed by 7. Those last two changes happens in sync with the copyright notice disappearing, 
It was not that counter I thought I would stumble upon, but maybe I had found something even better. My gut was telling me this memory location controlled game state. You know, when 25 is written to the location, show the copyright screen. On 6, show the game menu, and so on. So, bye bye old theory, and welcome new theory. I was now convinced there must be a section in the original assembly source code looking something like this. The last two lines sets the current game state to the value 25, being the copyright screen. For fun, let's assemble this source code to actual machine code. It's just 8 bytes and one of those bytes has the value 25, as one might expect. Now, Let's pretend for a while that these exact bytes actually do exist in the Tetris binary. Then, couldn't I just make a change? Replacing 25 with 6, the game menu screen. That should trick Tetris into skipping the copyright notice. Let's go back to the hex editor and search for those bytes. And there's exactly one hit. Almost too good to be true. But back then I felt confident. This new theory was probably right. I made a change. I replaced number 25 with the number 6. And then saved the modified copy of the game. Back then when this actually happened, uh, I tested this version of Tetris in the emulator. But it's much cooler if I uh, just use a real Game Boy. So, I have my modified version of Tetris on this cassette. And now when I start up this Game Boy, I expect to see the Nintendo logo, but then be taken directly to the game menu. No copyright screen. Let's see what, what, what happens. Success! So that's my story. I learned a lot, and here's my five takeaways. Number one, patterns can actually be helpful sometimes. Number two, when it comes to computing, everything is just numbers. Number three, it's great to have theories, sometimes they will turn out to be wrong though. That's okay, just come up with a new one. Number four, you can stumble upon interesting things by just eyeballing memory locations. And last but not least, sometimes changing, changing a single byte will save you seconds every day. At least every day that you decide to play Tetris. Now get out there and hack some Game Boy games on your own. And then tell me all about it. You can reach me at sven at dastan.net. I love getting emails. Thank you so much for listening. Bye bye. Hang on, be right back. I need to go crack some Game Boy games. Uh, okay, okay. We'll just hang here. Um, oh, wait, wait. I got to run a conference. Forgot about that. <laughs> oh, it was fun. Like, I like the, the theories, the different testing, the using your eyeballs. Um, I, I think someone mentioned on Discord they're going to add using my eyeballs to their resume as a skill. I think that's, that's a useful skill. <laughs> you know, if I can add puns as a LinkedIn skill, I think using your eyeballs is a perfectly valid skill to add as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all the important skills. <laughs> yes. So you know way more about hardware uh, than I do. Uh, what was, is it similar to your first experiences with like trying to hack some hardware, crack some things? Um. I haven't done too many cracks of like games like that. I have played with very th various other things. I remember um, back when Windows XP came out, uh, the little start button in the corner, you could change that to be other things if you opened up explorer.exe in a hex editor. So I like always like changing it to the howdy button. <laughs> I felt like, <laughs> what, what do you do? You click the howdy button and then you pick your program you want to run. It, Yeah, I remember those times of like investing so much time into your desktop icons and everything else and your Winamp. <sighs> yeah. It felt like hacking, even though it was just 
making a skin for Winamp, but it, it felt like a lot of hacking. <laughs> it, it's the start of uh, a more progressive, deeper career, I think. It's, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, I guess all of us started by just trying to make things more for ourselves. I love that. Um, and I also love the fact that <laughs> everyone in Discord uh, has calculated how much time uh, Sven actually saves by shaving off those eight seconds. And then it checks out that spending a few hours um, actually gives back the time over the course of five years because there is an XKCD for everything. <laughs> yes, yes. And of course, it wouldn't be bang bang con with a bunch of people going like, "Yeah, I wonder if that actually checks out," and then goes to to do the math to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, we've we've all been there. Uh, thank you, Sven. It was um, it was wonderful to to see your theories and how you finally got the results, and everyone was super satisfied that it worked. Uh, so yeah, I hope uh, this also encouraged a lot of other people to explore how they can do small hacks for fun uh, and save some time. Our next speaker. And I am very happy because this is the only name I am confident to actually pronounce correctly during Bang Bang Con this year is Pavel Marczewski. And he's going to talk, uh, his talk title, sorry, because it's an awkward sentence to say. His talk title is, it's like you're actually there, mouse pointer synchronization in an online tabletop game. Pavel's day job involves operating systems, but outside of work, he has always been making games. He likes interactive fiction, Japanese board games, Go and Mahjong, and rock climbing. Hello, everyone. So I want to talk about a project I made recently. And uh, the story goes like this. I like to play Mahjong. And uh, when I say Mahjong, you might be thinking about this one, but this is just a solitaire matching tiles game. And what I'm talking about is the four player game. It's actually played with the same tiles. It's uh, a lot like a card game. Each player has their hand of tiles uh, and they have, to, they have to pick the tiles, exchange them and so on. It's a great game when you play in person because uh, the game is fun, hunting the dice is fun, but you can also make small talk, you can uh, have some attention on game and some on socializing. And it's something I really missed during lockdown, and I tried to find a way to play with my friends online. And well, there are online Mahjong games, but not what I was looking for, because I like actually handling the tiles and the games usually do that uh, for you. They compute the score, you just click a tile and everything like plays for itself because they are computer games, not board games. So the other solution I looked to was uh, Tabletop Simulator. It's an engine for implementing different games and uh, uh, people actually implemented Mahjong in there several times, but uh, it's really for other board and card games and for Mahjong, you have to make some compromises. Like here, uh, they use cards instead of tiles. So again, not what I was going for. So I decided to make my own, and here it is. I hope you can see it. Uh, so this is a simulator specialized for Mahjong, and you can see that the table layout is predefined. It's not completely freeform, but you can move any tile. And crucially, you see other players doing it, moving the tiles. And initially, I thought it would be enough to just show you that the other show you the other tiles jumping, moving from source to destination. But actually seeing the actual cursor and uh, players making the movement uh, is very important. You really feel like the other people are playing with you. So I want to talk about how I implemented exactly that. And well, first of all, if we have a game like that, uh, we have to determine what the player is actually pointing to with the mouse cursor, because the player is moving the mouse on the screen, but uh, we have this game world, which is in 3D. And we, we do that by tracing a line from the player, from player's eyes, through the screen, through the cursor, into the game world. And this is an important uh, part that actually we compute the position in the 3D world, because uh, uh, initially, I was tempted to just cheat and uh, compute the position on the table, sort of where it intersects with the table. But the thing is that the other players are going to see your cursor from a different angle. So uh, if it shows uh, on the table, it, it's going to look exactly the same for you, but wrong for the, for the other player. So that was interesting for me. You need to treat the cursor as an actual object in the 3D world, even though it's just a... a it, 
it really has a two-dimensional position on the screen. And uh, here is an interesting effect that you can see related to that. Uh, on the left, you can, on the left, I'm just moving my mouse up and down, but on the right, seen, seen from the other player's perspective, uh, we are seeing that the cursor is actually jumping up uh, from the table because uh, we are pointing at uh, the table, then, then at a tile. And uh, well, uh, I would say that it's a feature, not a bug, because you can actually see what the other player is pointing at. Uh, but uh, more importantly, I want to talk about uh, how to how how did I make sure that the other player the, the other people see what I'm doing on the screen, uh, how to how to send the cursor position over the network, and uh, first I went with the simplest solution, which is just well everything I'm doing send it over the network. So uh, every time we detect that the cursor has moved, we compute its position and send the message over the network to the other player and uh, display it on the other computer. And this worked really well when I tested it on my own computer on, or on local network, but over an actual inter over the actual internet, uh, it uh, didn't really look that well. There was a lot of stuttering and the cursor jumping around. And this is because, well, for the movement to be really smooth, it would be something like 60, 60 frames per second, which means sending 60 messages per second. And even if even one of these messages gets delayed, you see the mouse cursor jumping. So even if the connection is, like, we are in the same city as the server, usually it's not going to be good enough. So the next thing I did was, uh, well, basically not sending so many updates. I sent uh, the new position, uh, every 100 milliseconds. So I'm like uh, sending it, sending 10, 10 frames per second. And this actually looks, looks like okay-ish. We played our first game this way and uh, it was playable. Uh, the animation is not so smooth, so it works. You can see what other people are doing and uh, uh, overall uh, it's workable, but I wanted to do better. So to do better, I want to make this position, uh, I want to make the movement smooth again. And my next thought was to maybe somehow compute the positions in between the real ones, uh, so that even if we have uh, 10 updates per second, we can display the motion in 60 frames per second. But the problem is that when we get a message about the position, it's already too late. The play player has already moved to the new position. Be so we need to display it. and. Uh, uh, then the next position comes and we have to display that. So in order to display smooth motion, we would have to somehow predict the future. And actually one of my, one of the things that I tried was predicting the future. So sort of like extrapolating the movement uh, and seeing what happened and drawing what would happen next. But this actually didn't look so well because the, the cursor was jumping forward, then when the actual position came, it uh, often was something different and the cursor had to jump back. So the real solution is to cheat, to lie to the player. We are simply pretending that everything is happening 100 milliseconds in the future. So everything is delayed. When we get a new position, we don't display it immediately, but uh, we display it 100 milliseconds later. So whatever I do at time zero, you see at time 100 milliseconds, what I, where I am at 100 milliseconds, you're going to see it at 200 milliseconds and so on. And because of that, you can actually plot a smooth uh, movement. Uh, and uh, one other thing is that, uh, remember how I told you about delayed messages? Now we can do something about that because uh, everything is uh, everything is happening with a delay anyway. So if we have connection problems, we have some irregular delays, uh, we can smooth it over because we are waiting to show the new position anyway. So the connection doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, so uh, I coded it, I tried it out and it worked, actually it wor worked amazing. It worked much better than I expected. You can see it here slowed down two times, but already you can see that the difference is huge uh, because the other cursor really moves the same as your own and it feels like the other people are there with you. They're playing with you, maybe not sitting next to you, but playing on the same computer. And I was worried that uh, everything in happening in the game has this delay and will, would people notice this delay? But since it's a board game, everything that people are doing is happening with a delay anyway. It, the motions are like, uh, uh, the, 
every actions that they do is going to take at least a second. So nobody notices it. Uh, so that's the project that I made. Uh, I made it really to play with my friends, but I was happy to learn that other people ended up playing it too. And uh, people say that it's the closest you can get to the real life Mahjong experience over the internet. It has been used for at least one tournament over internet. Some people use it as a tool for teaching the game so that they can show what happens in slow motion, explain everything in detail, correct people when they may make mistakes and so on. And some people even use it to play with custom rules. So they play and invent new rules on the fly and they add it to the game. So it's really something you, you cannot do with a, uh, with a regular uh, computer game. Uh, uh, so here uh, you can you you can also uh, see a blog post about uh, me making the game. I described this course of synchronization and some other aspects. I posted it also on on the Discord channel. And uh, really, that's all. Thank you for listening. And now I will be also staying around in chat to answer your questions. Thanks. That was awesome. I love it. Yeah. Now I want to learn magic. Like I was never particularly interested in it because I only knew like the Windows game that Pavel was showing showing in the beginning. And I'm like, wow, that's that's weird. But playing with friends and like learning, I wonder if maybe he could do like sign ups for teaching magic during Bang Bang Con. That'd be awesome. That would be cool. Yeah. One of the things I loved about this is it's a it seems on a surface level like such an easy thing. But there was so much thought and trial and error and, you know, process that had to go into it to make it even work, to seem like it was such an easy thing, is kind of boggling, you know? It's, it's yeah, human there's, perception there's a lot of that in tech, too. <laughs> yeah, it's like the human perception of the delay and, like, thinking about, like, what's jaggy and what not, what's not jaggy. And you have to, like, actually look into it and be like oh if i do it this way our brains accept it because brains are weird and they're extrapolating in weird ways mm -hmm. yeah and it kind of reminds me of uh there's a twitter thread last year or the year before i don't remember where people were posting things they did in video games to kind of like you wouldn't actually expect to happen and a lot of them were things like you know we had to you know like slow down the AI because it was too good against humans. And, uh, you know, how, you know, they had to kind of alter games to kind of like make them work when they, you know, the way you intuitively would think you'd make a yeah. game just doesn't work. And this kind of reminds me of that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much for that talk. Uh, our next talk is by John Femandella. Femandella, yeah. Yeah. Uh, John is an avid technologist, occasional public speaker, and curiosity advocate. He serves as a consultant, helping enterprises transform the way they write, operate, and deploy software. John is interested in bits, bucks, box, bots, and blocks. I think he did that to trip me up. Uh, he lives in Charlottesville, Virginia, and likes made of jokes, milkshakes, and referring to himself in the third person in speaker bios. Uh, John's talk is called TZ Data, Back to the Future. Hi, everyone. Welcome to TZ Data Back to the Future. I'd like to talk today about a fun, sometimes obscure data set, its tremendous impact on almost everything in modern computing, and the historical curiosity of one very specific line in this data set. Let's dive right in. Computers can do some things well, much better than even the most talented humans. I hope that's not a controversial statement. One of the things they do really well is to keep track of the passage of time. You barely need any electronic components for this to work. Something as simple as a quartz crystal that's part of an electrical circuit can be used as the basis for a digital clock. Frankly, I think this is amazing. We've tricked rocks into telling us what time it is. But if you want to know what time it is where you live, that is what horologists would call your local time, that's a very different idea. Now, using the physics of quartz crystals isn't enough because humans have invented a deviously complicated set of rules that tell us what the local time is. Those times can be different for each person on Earth. And because these rules have changed over time, knowing how to convert from one time to another gets even more complicated because it requires historical knowledge of when those rules changed, when they apply, and when they don't. 
Fortunately, in most computers, all of that complexity is codified by a set of standards we call the IANA Time Zone Database, or TZ Data for short. Because humans are peculiar and particular creatures, there are a lot of rules in TZ data to consider. In fact, depending on how you slice it, there are about 2,200 such rules in the database, each of which is needed if you want to have a correct understanding of local time in some time zone. Importantly, local time is not the same thing as a time zone. This is a common point of confusion for both non-technical and technical folks alike. The local time tells you what time it is on your clock relative to standard time. For example, we might say that the local time in Chicago right now is about 2 o'clock p.m. And no matter where we are in the world, we agree about what the standard time is. But the time zone is something else. It's the set of rules that tells us how to convert from standard time to local time. It is not a time in and of itself. Those rules are often different from place to place and different at different times of the year, and they usually vary historically. For example, the local time in Ecuador right now is also about 2 p.m., just like in Chicago. But Ecuador uses a totally different set of rules than Chicago does for determining the time, so it has a different time zone. It's just a coincidence, in other words, that their local times happen to be the same. They are in very different time zones. At a different time, for example, 2 p.m. on December 19th, 2021, we might see a difference in their local times because Ecuador doesn't use daylight savings time, unlike the U.S. or most of the U.S. Again, their time zone is different, and so their rules are different, and so we might wind up with different local times. Let's look at how you might read a particular TZ data time zone. This is one tiny excerpt from the rules you need for codifying time in just one specific place, which is uh, New York City and everything that's canonically part of the Eastern time zone. Here's the name of the time zone, America, New York. Above this are a set of rules that can be used by any of the time zones in the database to describe when those rules applied historically, how to apply them when they do apply, and what happens to the local time zone when you apply them. For example, these first two rules codify daylight savings time for the entire US. So right now, the US rules are that we add one hour to local time starting on the second Sunday in March at 2 a.m. And we revert to no offset to local time starting on the first Sunday in November at 2 a.m. local time. Together, these two rules help to find the offsets that apply at any particular time for any particular time zone that uses those rules. We can see here that the America New York time zone uses the US rules right now. The normal offset we should use is five hours behind the standard time, just like the first field in this row of the time zone's description says. But when the date is the second Sunday in March, or after that date, we apply a one hour positive offset, like the rule says, so we'd now be four hours behind standard time. Because these rules were written by people, they offer an interesting view into the complexity and vagaries of the history that the people were experiencing at the time. For instance, here, New York City set its own rules until 1967 that were different from the rest of the country. You can see that there's an NYC there and not a US. So what happened in 1967? Well, a bill called the Federal Uniform Time Act, or UTA, was passed that standardized how daylight savings time worked. So if you look in TZ data, you'll see a lot of different time zones standardizing around 1967 towards the US time zone rules. But guess what? There were problems. Indiana wanted to use two different time zones, and Michigan and South Dakota wanted to put, it, wanted to put what time it was up to a vote. One of the things I really love about TZ data is that the authors have inserted a bunch of stories, like actual prose, as code comments about how all the wackiness in time zones came to be. I won't spoil the fun in this talk because I think many of those stories are worth reading, but one of my favorite tales is about an Indiana legislator named Herbert Copeland, who was so furious about the idea of needing to set his clock differently at different points in the year that he broke the official clock in the Indiana state capitol as a protest. I think Representative Copeland would probably have hated being a software developer. But for me, one of the most interesting lines that shows up over and over again across dozens of time zones, not necessarily even in the US, is this one. It says that on November 18th, 1883, New York stopped using something called LMT and switched to a standardized time. 
and so did almost everywhere else in the US. So what's LMT and why did people switch from it? LMT is short for local mean time. Roughly speaking, it's the time you would keep if you measured 24 hours as being the time between two consecutive high noons, the time when the sun is the highest in the sky at your position. In this diagram, it's what you get if you count 24 hours as the time it takes for Earth to go from location one to location three. One huge problem with LMT, of course, is that two different observers at different places on Earth will measure the sun as reaching high noon at different times on the same day. So that means that cities that are separated by as little as 20 miles apart won't agree about what time it is. Now, in the 19th century, that didn't matter that much because there was no easy way to travel quickly. If it took you a day to travel 20 miles, by walking or by horseback, you would just set your watch at the destination using their local mean time. But in 1869, after years of backbreaking work and horrific working conditions for immigrant laborers, the United States Transcontinental Railroad was completed, joining the Eastern US with the Western US for the first time. That reduced the coast to coast travel times from months to about six days. Shortly after high noon local mean time on May 10th, 1869, at Promontory Point in Utah, the two railroads were connected. Because there were no time standards in place, the time the final spike was driven was reported in accordance with local time across the country, 1245 at Promontory Point, 1144 and 1146 in different parts of San Francisco, and 249 in Washington, D.C. This created a problem because the railroad operators also kept their own versions of local time on a particular railway line, resolving local mean time and railroad time was contentious. Railroads wanted to keep their own time and towns wanted to keep theirs. So it was only through the joint efforts of Charles Dowd, a seminary teacher, Sanford Fleming, a railroad surveyor, and William Allen, a railroad engineer, that the solution was finally reached. Every railway stop would align to a standard time and be in exactly one of four time zones, Eastern, Central, Mountain, or Pacific. The switchover to this new standard would take place at noon local mean time. Because everyone's local mean time wasn't quite the same relative to their newly formed time zone, everyone had different offsets. And that's why the LMT offsets are different for each city in TZ data. What these lines in TZ data show us, in other words, are the historical birth of time zones in this country. And that's just the US. Almost every country in TZ data has their own interesting origin story for when and how they standardized on times. And many of these stories are written down in the code comments of TZ data itself. I never would have known this story if breadcrumbs to it hadn't been left behind in TZ data by the many contributors to the data set over the years. So if I can leave you with one request, it's that if your software has a complicated and interesting history, write it down. You never know if other people might find it interesting too. Thanks for giving me your own time. Please feel free to reach out with questions and enjoy the rest of the conference. I love how confusing time zones are, and then we can have a talk just about how confusing time zones are. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking it's about time we had a talk on time zones. Never mind. Um, <laughs> yeah. I also, I, I found it particularly interesting that not only, like, I knew there were rules around time zones, but that the rules list keeps growing. It doesn't, it doesn't, like, erase the old rules and create new rules. They just keep tacking on the rules. So as you look back on dates in the past, you can still even see like the, the evolution of time zones. Yeah, I guess people like to have their own piece of culture in the bigger culture that we have. And, you know, time zones for me, as someone coming from a single time zone country, uh, time zones are still terrifying and fascinating. And whenever I have to organize a meeting on my team, I check my calendar five times because um, it's just not something I learned when I was growing up, uh, checking your time zone. So yeah, I love that. It's confusing also for people who grew up with time zones as a thing. Yeah. And as somebody who's bounced around from Windows to Mac to Linux, I found even <laughs> just switching between those, they all store times differently in, within the system. And so you have to kind of figure out, you know, like sometimes Linux tends to store things UTC or Windows stores at local time. And it's it's kind of interesting to see that, although also frustrating at the same time. <laughs> yeah, all the fun we can have.
Um, awesome. That was, uh, that was that was our last talk uh, for this session. And um, the next thing to do is to go to Skittish and hang out and explore the space and give some more. I, I love that after uh, yesterday's talk from Sarah, people were talking about adding a, a little cheese plate hat to Skittish or something, you know, uh, to, to incorporate some of those elements. So if, if you're a ticket holder, go explore, um, find some more ideas and, you know, meet fellow Bang Bang Kölner. Okay, I, I have painted myself in the corner with this one. I, I don't know, um, how do we call it? Bang Bang Kön Air? Bang Bang Kön E? Let's figure out the name. Let's talk it over amongst ourselves, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we would love to thank the speakers uh, today. Um, so Dasha, Elina, Svel, Dulstrand, Pavel Marczewski and John Feminella, thank you for being here with us. Um, and also at this um, slightly unusual time for this week, uh, we're, we're hoping that this also gives uh, people in other time zones, speaking of time zones, the feeling of the sync bang bang con, not just a sync watch. And the sync watch for this session uh, will be today uh, at 5.30 a.m. IST, 2 a.m. CST, 1 a.m. BST, 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific. So if you are in North America, probably this is going to be the sync watch session for you. Um, yeah, what else should be mentioned? I think we should mention our sponsors again, right? Uh, yeah. Again, thank you for all of our wonderful sponsors. I believe Cindy can probably pull up the sponsor slide. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Xander and Daily, uh, Wherewithal, Phase Row, Full Story, Mapbox, Two Sigma, Discourse, and Accelerated Tech. Thank you all for uh, helping making our conference uh, wonderful as well as accessible. And don't forget, uh, everybody, if you're tweeting out, tweet out with the virtual BangBangCon hashtag or tag us with at BangBangCon. We, we love seeing all the tweets and what people are loving about the conference. Yep. And we will see you soon for our next session. So remember, today evening North America, we have a sync watch for this session we just had. And tomorrow in the morning, North American time, so at the same time that this session started, we have a sync watch for our session from Tuesday. Today is Wednesday, yep. right? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> and then our next live session, Sarah, do you remember the times for that? Um, the next live session will be tomorrow. It will be, um, I think, all the same times, 5 a.m. Uh, IST, 2 a.m. CEST, 1 a.m. BST, 8 p.m. Eastern, and 5 p.m. Pacific. Yes. You will see you soon. All right. Bye.